Let's start on the stimulus measures, these policy pivots that we've heard on multiple fronts, whether it's monetary, fiscal, on the housing market. How significant is it? Is, is it enough to turn around this economy? Well, the short answer is probably no. Uh, the, and the reason I think this way is that the China's entering what I call balance sheet recession. And balance sheet recession happens when people stop minimizing debt instead of maximizing profits, in that well, you know, all these people who leverage themselves during the bubble, when the asset prices collapse, you know, asset prices are down, but the liabilities are still up there, and your know, balance sheets are, are often underwater, you have to reduce this uh, debt. But when everybody does this all at the same time, the economy really suffers because in a national economy, if someone's saving money, someone else has to be borrowing money. And in the usual economy, those of us in the financial sector will take the money from the savers, give it to someone who can use it. And if there are too many borrowers, rates are raised by the central bank. Uh, too few borrowers, rates are lower to make sure that this cycle is maintained. But hmm. uh, what we entered in Japan 30 years ago and what China may be entering now is a situation where you bring interest rates down to zero or to very low levels. Still, there are not enough borrowers because people are repairing balance sheets or just not borrowing money, period. And I still hear that a lot of Chinese people are reluctant to buy real estate with borrowed money, especially when you don't think the prices will go up, but it could actually come down even more. And in that environment, uh, it's very difficult to get borrowers to come in, even with very low interest rates. And some of the structural reform arguments that I hear from Chinese, I mean, those reforms are all welcome, and I think some of them are long overdue. But the question is, will that be enough to fill the gap from people who are saving money and people who are not borrowing money? Uh, mm -hmm. If I may give you any very good example, suppose I have $1,000 of income myself and I spend 900 myself. The 900 is already someone else's income, so that's not a problem. The $100 that I save mm -hmm. will go through a financial sector like us and give it to someone who can use it. And if there are too many borrowers uh, uh, for the $100, rates are raised, rates are lowered if there are too few, and that's how the usual economy moves. But in what I call balance sheet recession, what happens is that I have $1,000 of income and I spend 900 myself. That 900 is not a problem, but the $100 often gets stuck in the financial sector because there are no borrowers, even at very low interest rates. And in that situation, the only way you can turn the situation uh, to improve the economy is for the government to borrow money. And why is that? Because the private sector is doing all the right things, trying to repair their balance sheets. So you cannot tell them not to read the balance sheets. So what you, so if everybody's doing the right things, but you get the wrong result, you know this is called fallacy of composition in English. Then mm. the government, which is outside the fallacy of composition, has to come in. And the amount that Chinese government is uh, coming forward, I don't think is sufficient to really uh, stabilize and turn the situation around. Right, and Richard, maybe the central government is starting in that direction, and I'm not sure if you agree with that. Uh, agree with that uh, narrative because the central government has started to come out and issue special purpose bonds, and I'm wondering whether you think that's the right route because you mentioned the government starts needs to start borrowing, and also what is a number you think that the central government or the government should be borrowing given the scale of the Chinese economy and the debt burden they're trying to unwind as well. Well, on the first question, we all pay a lot of attention to central government numbers. But you know, if you put in the local provincial governments, the Chinese uh, government financial deficit, which is more or less equivalent to uh, total budget deficit, was almost 7% yeah. of GDP at 2022. So when the budget deficit before the bubble burst is already 7% of GDP, there's always a resistance to, to increase this more just to fight the balance sheet recession. Because balance sheet recession started probably 2023, not 2022. 2022, 2022 you know, we still had a bubble. Uh, when Jap Japan fell into this thing, Japan had a budget surplus during the bubble days. So it was easy for the Japanese government to increase deficit spending because it was uh, in surplus. But for the Chinese government, even though central government budget deficit is not very large, if you put the whole thing together, we call it general government, then the budget deficit right. is already 7%. And I think there's a strong resistance
from local governments, provincial governments, and, and probably from many economists who are saying that, hey, the debt is already too large. How, how can we increase this any further? So that's where the resistance is coming from. Uh, the, the difference between the Japanese and the Chinese situation, another difference is that back in 1990, when this whole thing collapsed, the whole bubble collapsed, no one in Japan, including myself, had any idea of what we were entering. That is to say, BOJ brought rates down to zero, nothing happens, fiscal stimulus never created this <coughs> Keynesian <coughs> uh, pump priming, and all those structural reform measures never produced the results they were promised, uh, that were promised. And so we were completely lost. And we, we now know why that is the case. Uh, if you're putting a structural reform, unless someone then responds to that and immediately borrows the $100 that I mentioned to you earlier, so that it's 900 plus yeah. $100,000 against the original income, uh, that is not likely to happen with a structural reform. These things take, take, typically take a long time. So, so I very uh, happy that the Chinese government is coming up with these structural reform issues, but for those to have immediate effect, uh, I'm very, very skeptical. And As to the why you're saying that China can't can't really export its way out of these problems, Richard, um, given the trade surplus, but th th that is the policy direction that we're seeing um, with Xi Jinping's agenda when it comes to uh, you know high-end manufacturing, EVs, the like here, which is now facing pushback from Western nations with tariffs and the potential threat of tariffs. Mm. How do you see this industrial policy playing out then? Well, uh, I was in the middle of U.S.-Japan trade friction 30 years ago. Uh, Walter Mondale, the ambassador to Japan at the time, realized that I'm on Japanese te television a lot on these economic programs, but I actually carry an American passport. So he asked me to get in there and uh, pitch the American argument on why Japan should open its market and so forth. So I was <laughs> pushing into that. Uh, debate as a private sector citizen, still employee of Nomura, but it was a very ugly uh, debate, and mm. bad feelings on both sides were growing very, very rapidly. So I remember all of that. It's not an experience that typical you know, economists in Wall Street firms have, but I ended up having it. Then I look at what's happening in China today, I see the same pattern. And the key point is that at that time, Japan was the largest trade surplus country in the world and running a huge surplus against the United States. Now we see China in exactly the same position. And China is the largest trade surplus country in the world, running a huge surplus vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. And so the same pattern is developing by, by people saying, well, you're already running the largest trade surplus in the world. How can you expand that more and destabilize the global trade? And furthermore, because China is uh, paying all these subsidies to many, many companies and many industries, a feeling within the trade circles is that, hey, China is doing the uh, su subsidies. Why can't we just fight with the tariffs? And you know, you're not supposed to raise tariffs within the WTO uh, membership countries, but when the other side is doing something that you're not supposed to do, then of course you think you can do uh, the other things to defend yourself. And that's, the, uh, I think, where the debate is moving. But I don't think China removing their <coughs> subsidies or uh, various helps to the industries anytime soon. I mean, so many of those companies are, of course, government-owned. And so my feeling is that uh, unless something is down, perhaps on the exchange rate, it's going to be very difficult to stop right. this trade from getting worse. And I was about to say, Richard, since you brought up the exchange rate, yeah. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the main difference between Japan then and China now was the exchange rate regime. But all that said, you know, if if China was to let markets fully determine, say, where dollar China, the, the exchange rate was to be trading right now, do you think it goes in the same direction as dollar yen after the bubble burst, which was effectively go to about 80? Well, <coughs> at that time, 
the U.S. was so upset, and the U.S. government made its displeasure known that Japanese are not opening its market and so many other restrictions. That scared the investors in Japan from buying U.S. Treasuries. And if the Japanese investors stop buying U.S. assets, if you just look at the trade, because Japan is a huge surplus country, uh, that basically pushed the dollar lower, yen higher, and we ended up, you know, 79, 75 yen to the dollar by 1995. That basically precluded Japan from running uh, export-led economic growth. Now, in the Chinese case, that, is, that doesn't work that way because there's so much capital controls to begin with. And so exchange rate could, is still largely under the control of the government. But if the government tries to uh, keep the exchange rate from appreciating or trying to uh, weaken, the, weaken the yen, then my sense is that U.S. push for more tariffs will just get will get even worse.